I, I hope that it reflects my the diversity of my research interests. Uh, and so basically, there we go. All right, so we're all here because of magnetic resonance, both spectroscopy and imaging. And with my background, I have a little bit of both. And it's an excellent um, umbrella of techniques because you can look at a variety of different types of samples, everything from solids to squishy living organisms. And you can get very, very high um, resolution images using MRI, and you can get very rich spectroscopic detail as well using spectroscopy. You can even overlay the two um, using something like chemical shift imaging. So it's a really, really great technique. Uh, I don't have to sell you on it. You're all here at this, at this uh, meeting. And so some of the reasons why magnetic resonance is great, it's non-invasive and non-destructive. It doesn't blast your sample with ionizing radiation. It doesn't fragment it into 10 to the N pieces. And if you're doing imaging, there's really nothing better at looking at soft tissue. So MR is great, except where it's not. And the main place where it's not is in sensitivity. There's a fundamental lack of detection sensitivity just due to the distribution of nuclear spins at thermal equilibrium. Um, and furthermore, or, um, there can be some specificity um, issues in imaging especially. So you can get a, it's, it's a bit like looking through a Where's Waldo book. You can get really high resolution information, but then it's hard to pick out exactly what you're looking for. Um, and if you've looked through an MRI scan and try to play like, where's the, where's the problem at? Um, or look through a very dense protein spectra, then you have an idea. Sometimes it's nice to look at everything, but sometimes it's good to pick out exactly what you're interested in. And so a lot of my research interests have been kind of overcoming some of these limitations by increasing detection sensitivity mostly, uh, as well as taking some care to look at increasing the specificity as well. And so this low detection sensitivity just comes from how the nuclei are distributed at thermal equilibrium. And because the change in energy between different magnetic sublevels is very, very small. The populations are nearly equal and they're oppositely aligned. So they mostly cancel each other out. And so you're only really detecting maybe one out of every 50,000 nuclear spins, you know, kind of depending on what it is you're looking at. So you get very, very weak signal, which necessitates signal averaging over and over and over again for minutes to days to however long it is. And there's some ways to address this, right, from our equation here, um, you know, because it's a bulk Boltzmann distribution, we can, um, you know, we can increase the strength of the magnetic field to get higher polarization, and, th and that helps, but you hit a point of diminishing returns because you can only make magnets so strong, and as you do, they get more and more expensive and harder to house and take care of. The other thing, you can lower the temperature of your sample, um, and if you do it enough, that's called brute force polarization, uh, which it works, but um, once again, not every sample likes to be frozen, especially if you're doing MRI on people. People don't like being frozen solid. Um, and also one of the main benefits of magnetic resonance is you can look at things in their native state. And if you have to freeze it to look at it, you're no longer looking at it in its native state. So the way that kind of what my background has shown me is the way you get around this is very, very simple is you just cheat. Uh, use some clever chemistry and physics to temporarily realign these nuclear spins so that instead of canceling each other out, they're constructively working together to build magnetization and to give you much, much higher signals. In fact, orders of magnitude better in signals. And this is basically can be the difference between you know, being able to see something and not being able to see something. And really it's equivalent to taking a dime and blowing it up to the size of a building. Um, and it, so for instance, the, the city hall in Philadelphia, which if you've never seen it, is a magnificent piece of architecture. And so I don't think I have to sell you on why it's good to have orders of magnitude more signal, but the three main ones that I always kind of circle back to are that it lets you look at things that aren't hydrogen, because a lot of NMR is proton, most MRI is proton. It's nice to be able to look at things that aren't protons um, for a variety of reasons. The second one is if you don't have to signal average, if you can get a full high sensitivity um, signal just quickly like that, one shot, one image, second, um, then you can start to look at things that happen on fast time scales, um, like tracking changes in metabolism inside of cells, for instance. And the third kind of pushes back against the idea of going to stronger and bigger magnetic fields because this hyperpolarization is independent of the field strength. So 
you don't need bigger or stronger magnets. Actually, you can go to smaller magnets. You can do benchtop NMR. You can do Earth's field NMR, right? So um, it kind of opens up magnetic resonance for for places that can't afford multi-million dollar superconducting magnets. Um, and so for hyperpolarization, there's three main types. And the first one I'm just going to mention briefly, that's spin exchange optical pumping. This is the only slide I have about optical pumping. And I only have it on here it's because optical pumping was my first true love. It's the reason I got into research to begin with. As an undergraduate, I was in my early 20s, and here I have this real mad scientist um, type of experiment where you have lasers and magnets and liquid nitrogen and alkali metals that will explode if you expose them to the air. It's really, really neat stuff. And it got me into science and I did a lot of science on it. I'm, I, I don't so much anymore, but I did. And it's mostly on xenon, uh, which is great because it has a relatively high natural abundance. It has a really sensitive chemical shift range. So it's really, really sensitive to its environment. So you can use it potentially as a molecular biosensor. Where you mostly find it is in pulmonary imaging. It's hard to get an MRI of your lungs, so you can polarize this gas. So all the xenon line up, and they all give you a really high signal. And then you can breathe that in, because xenon's non-toxic. It's slightly anesthetizing, to be honest with you. Um, and so you can get really nice lung imaging and see things like COPD and asthma and cystic fibrosis. Um, and so a lot of my work was basically... How do we make large amounts of xenon that are polarized really well? And some of those got kind of carried out into clinical scale, you know, xenon polarizers that are used in hospitals. So anyway, optical pumping is one way of hyperpolarization, but um, the way that you're more likely to have heard of would be dynamic nuclear polarization, which is pretty popular. And I even heard talked about a little bit here and there in some of the morning's talks. Um, and for this meeting, I think maybe many in the audience will think of DNP as being a tag on to magic angle spinning solid state NMR. And that's that's a relatively new development for DNP. But my background in DNP was more in biomedical imaging. And a lot of people in that community are looking at metabol or at hyperpolarizing small molecule metabolites mostly pyruvate. Pyruvate works well because it has a relatively long T1 for this class of molecules. It has a T1 of about a minute or so. And it really sits at a useful intersection in the metabolic cycle, especially with cancer detection. So as you mentioned previously, I did a postdoc at MD Anderson Cancer Center. So there's a lot of looking at changes in metabolism with respect to tumors. Um, and so basically with pyruvate is if you have normal healthy cells, pyruvate gets converted into acetyl-CoA and it goes on the rest of the metabolic cycle. For tumors, a lot of the tumors will actually metabolize pyruvate differently. They'll create lactate and alanine. They go down a different pathway. It's not very efficient, but tumors have never been accused of being that efficient. Um, and so because that increased signal on the carbon-13 stays on that carbon-13, as the, as the metabolite metabolizes and changes forms into different molecules, you get a, sh a change in chemical shift to let you see what it's being converted into. So you can basically look at a, basically a sample that's healthy um, and just see pyruvate signal that gradually decreases with time. And with a tumor, you actually see a rise of a lactate signal. And this um, has been used a lot in preclinical and basic science. You can buy DNP kits that are just about push button, such as the Hypersense, which are widely available. And that has been transferred into the clinic. There's a clinical scale DNP kit called the Spin Lab. It's made by GE. And a lot of work has been pioneered by the team at UCSF, which is this huge huge uh, group of, of researchers. And they put out a paper a while back uh, where they did this in, in people and they could see, basically they could diagnose uh, prostate cancer using hyperpolarized pyruvate in cases that you wouldn't be able to see it if you didn't use pyruvate. So it can potentially quite useful. That's what I think of when I think of DNP, and I don't do that type of DNP. My DNP is nothing with pyruvate. My interest is in silicon nanoparticles and micron scale particles. And silicon doesn't get a lot of love from NMR, to be honest with you. Uh, even though the silicon 29 isotope is NMR active, and it's about a little bit less than 5% naturally abundant, and you know, gyro, gyro, gyro magnetic ratio is uh, in the same ballpark as carbon, and a little bit less, but not awful. Uh, and silicon is really biocompatible. It's actually a dietary supplement. It's a thickening agent, sometimes in milkshakes and smoothies and things like that. 
and you don't naturally have a lot of silicon in your body, so there's no background signal to compete against. And really one of the best things about silicon has a really simple surface chemistry. So it's really easy to attach things to it, such as targeting agents like antibodies, aptamers, small peptide strands, um, as well as therapeutic drugs. And there's a whole class of researchers that look at silicon particles just as drug delivery vehicles and nothing else. The other thing is, be, you know, um, DNP itself is really expensive. Uh, but the silicon particles themselves are dirt cheap, and one of the reasons for that is it's basically dirt, right? Um, and so while the DNP may cost a lot of money, the silicon particles themselves won't, uh, which is also nice. So DNP basically works. You have um, low temperatures and a high magnetic field, which induce an electron spin polarization that approaches unity. And then you basically take that magnetization from the electrons, you transfer it to nearby nuclei through these microwave mediated dipolar interactions. And so basically you can build up silicon um, nuclear spin polarization over time. For the particles, um, this happens on the surface. So on the surface of the particle are all these dangling bond electronic defects. And so the surface of the particles already has this rich source of endogenous free electrons. So we don't typically have to add an exogenous radical species like you do for pyruvate. Um, and so that's nice. And that happens on the surface and it basically works its way into the core through spin diffusion. The downside is it takes a while, usually hours, before you fully kind of polarize into the core of the particle. But once you do, you benefit from a really, really long relaxation time. Most hope, one of the main downsides of hyperpolarized magnetic resonance is it doesn't last very long, especially in vivo, because traditionally hyperpolarized agents like xenon, which is a single atom, or pyruvate, which is a small molecule, is basically, beat up by people's insides. All the chemistry that's going on in their body basically depletes that nuclear spin polarization really quick. The silicon particles in the core of the particle, silicon nuclei in the core of the particle, um, are relatively well protected. And so they don't suffer from very quick relaxation. So instead of tens of seconds, you actually have tens of minutes of enhanced signal. The T1 is usually in the range of 10 minutes up to 40 minutes. And if you get like kind of millimeter sized silicon beads, you can see the, the signal for hours afterwards. It's really, really neat. So it holds on to the signal for a long time. And so we were basically interested in taking advantage of the simple surface chemistry to use silicon particles as a targeting platform. Um, and so in this case, we were looking at colon cancer and some forms of colon cancer overexpress MUC1. Uh, this is a highly glycosylated transmembrane protein. It sticks pretty far out from the cell surface, uh, even compared to EGFR, which is a pretty common targeting group. Um, and so we can target this using an antibody and we can attach our antibody onto the silicon particles using a pretty simple linkage of aminopropyl triethoxysilane as well as polyethylene glycol. You attach it by a, by a sulfide bridge and you can use it to target MUC1 and colon cancer. And really, the, the one of the main benefits of silicon particles is that you can use the same linkage to attach other things as well. Say you don't want to look at colon cancer, you want to look at HER2 expression in breast cancer, you just put on a HER2 targeting uh, antibody. Or if you want to look at PMSA overexpression in prostate cancer, you put on that antibody instead. So it's not just looking at colon cancer. You can look at a lot of stuff. You just change the end of it out. And if you're interested in multiplexing, then you can attach multiple antibodies onto the same particle. Um, so it's, it's really kind of developing it as a platform technology. And so for colon cancer, uh, there's a couple of reasons why we chose it. One is that colon cancer is actually quite deadly if you don't, if you don't get it treated and get it seen about quickly. So there's a real kind of impetus of, of early detection. And the second is that um, if you have tumors being expressed in the lower intestinal tract, there's a pretty convenient port of entry for getting contrast agents into that mouse system. Um, and so as a proof of concept, uh, we basically injected silicon particles through the rectum of the mouse and were able to image the lower intestinal tract that we'll see here on this top left figure. So we can see like, okay, we can, we can use silicon nanoparticles and get a nice looking image of uh, the lower intestinal tract of a mouse. So let's move forward with this. Um, and the, the next kind of thing to worry about is when we're attaching the antibody through this linkage, we're changing the surface chemistry and we need that surface chemistry for those endogenous free electrons. So we wanted to make sure that these functionalized particles uh, 
still behave the same as far as DNP goes. And the good news is they do. They still get the same enhancement value and the same T1 rate as well. That's this middle figure. And then we want to see, well, if we inject these particles into a colorectal tumor, like how long does the signal last? Can we see it after a while? So we use a, instead of in, basically use a subcutaneous model where the colorectal tumor that expresses MUC1 is on the side of the mouse and we just injected particles into it. And then went and got a cup of coffee, came back 20 minutes later and we can still see a good amount of signal as well. Particles are just right where we left them. So um, these things kind of point in the direction that this type of thing is plausible. Uh, separately, and I don't have a slide for this, but you know we have to do the chemistry to attach the antibodies onto the surface ahead of time and then do DNP on it, and then put it in the mouse. So uh, we had to make sure that DNP didn't wreck the antibody because you're freezing it down to like two Kelvin and blasting it with microwaves for hours. And so we did some in vitro studies to ensure that, you know, that antibody still targets just fine after DNP, which was a nice hurdle to clear. So that's our proof of concept. We then move that into an actual orthotopic model for colon cancer. And if you're not familiar, orthotopic just means the tumor is in the organ that it's supposed to be in. So we had mice that spontaneously grew MUC1 expressing colorectal tumors in their lower intestinal tract. This is a bit of a busy figure, but basically the top row are your MRI scans. Um, the anatomical proton image is in grayscale, and the colored bits are the silicon signal from the silicon particles. And so for the top left one, that is our positive targeting experiment where we have a mouse that has colon tumors that express MUC1. We have our antibody functional light particles, and we can see that it attracts to those tumor sites. And we know those tumor sites because we checked it out ahead of time. And if you've ever wondered, can you give a mouse a colonoscopy? The answer is yes, you can. And we have still images from the colonoscopy videos down here in this middle row. So we can basically look ahead of time and see how many tumors there are and approximately where they are, um, and then correlate that afterwards with our MRI scans. These other images over here are all different controls. We have a biological control where we have a mouse that expresses colon tumors, but they don't have MUC1. You can see we don't get much signal from that. We have our MUC1 mice, but with particles that don't have the antibody attached, and we don't get much signal from that either. And then we have our MUC1 mice and our antibody particles, but those MUC1 sites have already been pre-blocked with an antibody, so there's nothing for the particles to latch onto, and we don't see signal there. So we see signal where we expect to see signal, and we don't so much where we're not expecting to see signal. And afterwards, you can sacrifice the mouse, you can you can harvest you know, the lower intestinal tract, which we have a picture of that here, uh, I guess better after lunch than before. And um, we can also do histology on this to basically see um, where the particles are versus where they're not. And basically we can see signal where we expect it. So that kind of is promising for future development, so to speak. And those were all with these large micron scale particles, which is what we started working with mostly because uh, they polarized really well. And we always knew that we wanted to move more towards the nano scale because that's really going to be more relevant. The large particles have some mobility issues. Um, they fall out of solution. They're not awesome. And so we've tried nano scale particles off and on over time and we really never got as good of DNP results from them. And so uh, one day we tried electron spin resonance to see what, you know, basically compare how many free electrons those small particles have compared to the large ones. And the answer is not much. Uh, the large particles have way more endogenous electrons and it's not so much you know, surface to volume ratio because that's going in the wrong direction. It's really because the nanoscale particles are nice nanoparticles. They're monocrystalline, they're very nice. Um, these large micron scale particles not very nice. They're polycrystalline, they're amorphous, you know, um, they have a lot of unsavory bits. And those unsavory bits basically are full of electronic defects. Um, and so what we did to move towards the nanoscale is we bit the bullet and we just added a radical species to it, just like you would for pyruvate. 
In fact, we added Tempo, which is kind of an entry level um, radical. And we did a lot of studies. This is just one slide. We looked at different sizes of particles. We looked at different concentrations of radical. But basically, the take home message is for these smaller nanoscale particles, there's a clear benefit to adding a radical to them. Um, you get between one and a half and six times as much signal, depending on the exact conditions. And by adding the radical, you do lose a little bit of T1. The nice part is, is that you've got a lot of T1 to lose, so it's not that big of a deal. And also, the gain in signal from adding the radical far outweighs the loss of T1, um, such that you know, you'd have to go out about 45 minutes after you finish DNP before it makes sense to say like, oh, I wish I hadn't added a radical to that. All right, so you get way more signal from the radical um, induced species. So we took all this together and basically did some in vivo imaging. Previous in vivo images had just been on the large microscale particles. Uh, as far as we know, this is the first time it's been done in nanoscale particles. We didn't go about the hassle of trying to extract the radical from the particles, which is kind of a big deal in pyruvate uh, DNP, getting the radical species out and not injecting it into the mice. We went the whole kit and caboodle into the mouse. We didn't see any detrimental effects. Uh, we didn't study the detrimental effects very hard, but we, you know, the mouse didn't kill over and die or didn't die the next day. You know, they still lived uh, reasonably happy lives until they didn't anymore. Um, so, so basically, we were able to not only just polarize these small particles, but polarize them well enough to get in vivo imaging. And that's not trivial, just because with MRI your signal gets separated into all these different pixels or voxels if you're doing 3D imaging. Um, and so, you know, it takes a lot of signal to get an MRI image because it's all delocalized all over the place. Um, so it's, it's, an, it's an important hurdle to clear. We also collaborated with a colleague at Hanyang University in Seoul, Korea. Um, and he provided um, mesoporous silicon particles, which we run through its paces, they polarize fine, they have a nice 20 minute long T1, and we can image them in phantoms. Uh, and with these as well, we had to add the, uh, the radical species also. And so kind of wrapping up with our silicon uh, DNP, you know, we realized we do silicon DNP and everybody else does carbon 13 DNP of pyruvate. And we thought, well, what if we can kind of somewhat combine these into silicon carbide? And we were able to take silicon carbide microparticles and monitor basically the buildup and decay of the silicon signal as well as the carbon-13 signal um, and get T1 rates, you know, of in the 10 to 20 minute range. Um, and also do in vivo imaging on those as well. So inject them into a tumor and then we can get a silicon MRI that we have in red and a carbon-13 MRI in blue and overlay them as well. Um, I don't know about long-term. Silicon carbide is kind of a neat playground. I don't know if it's going to be used long-term in vivo, especially the particles we use because they're not round spherical particles. They're really jagged looking. So we'd probably have to try to find some spherical particles to uh, be nicer to the mice with. And so a lot of this work I did before coming to Rowan. Um, and so since I've been here, we've been able to acquire our own um, DNP kit, which has just kind of been brought to life in the last few months. Um, we're still in the process of bringing it fully online, so I don't have any exciting data to show for you today, but check back a little bit later and hopefully I will. Uh, it's basically, it's a Teslatron magnet, which I believe is basically the inside of a hypersense unit. Uh, and has an integrated cryostat, which means that basically it steals some of the liquid helium from the magnet and uses it to cool the sample, which is both really convenient and really terrifying for me at least. Um, but with that, you can pull a vacuum on that cryostat and you get down to around two Kelvin pretty regularly. Um, and we have our millimeter wave source of 140 gigahertz, uh, just a little bit less than a watt full of that. And we should be able to monitor, you know, silicon and carbon based NMR signals uh, in real time using our own little tech mag lap NMR setup, which we have over here in the corner. So, you know, check back later. I, I'm sure we're gonna have great results on DNP here at Rowan. So that's my DNP spiel. Um, the rest of the talk is about parahydrogen. Parahydrogen's kind of the third main type of hyperpolarization, and it's the new kid on the block 
as far as popularity goes here recently. Um, and so parahydrogen is just the singlet state of hydrogen gas. The two nuclei are oppositely aligned. If you've been paying attention, you would say, hey, that doesn't give you an NMR signal. That actually does gives you nothing. And you're right, it doesn't. It doesn't give you anything. Except a really, really high nuclear spin order, which you can transfer to other molecules of interest you can enhance the signal on those other molecules. We'll talk about that in just a second. Uh, but basically, for a parahydrogen generator, your first step is to make parahydrogen. So you can do that on your own. It's pretty easy to make your own generator. I'll show you mine in a second. You can also buy them. People sell them. There's different companies um, that will sell you parahydrogen generator and basically takes parahydrogen from its 25% abundance at room temperature to some enhanced level, usually 50% or up to 100%. And so um, parahydrogen has been around actually for a while. Um, and as far as using it to um, increase MR signals, that was shown a few decades ago by Russ Bowers and Dan Weidekamp. Um, and they use a hydrogenation reaction um, that basically, you know, you can break a double bond and you can add a hydrogen atom on either side of the double bond. As long as it's asymmetric, you can basically transfer that magnetization to other nuclei. You can look at the proton signal on its own as well. You'll get a nice enhanced proton signal. But really what I'm interested in is looking at things that aren't proton. Um, so you can transfer it to something like carbon-13 and enhance the signal of carbon-13. Um, and unlike DNP, this is really, really cheap and also really fast. Instead of you know DNP for an hour or for hours, um, this takes a couple of seconds, literally. It's just bubbling gas into an NMR tube and put it in an NMR. Um, you do a field sweep basically to transfer magnetization from the parahydrogen onto whatever you're interested in, but it's really, really quick. Um, and so it's really, really useful. The reason why it was it was demonstrated decades ago and it's only taken really taken off in the last 10 years is that it for a long time basically it just relies on this hydrogenation reaction which really limits what you can use it for because it has to have a double or triple bond otherwise it's not going to work there's lots and lots of biomolecules that don't have double or triple bonds and so it kind of you know it wasn't as exciting so to speak now then recently a nice interesting workaround has come about uh, called basically this parahydrogen induced polarization, which is this umbrella of, of techniques, but uh, it's a sidearm hydrogenation. And so you can take your molecule you're interested in and attach a sidearm to it, which is a different molecule, uh, and then hydrogenate the sidearm and then transfer that enhanced magnetization to the molecule you're interested in and then basically cleave the bond, sidearm goes away. Now you've got enhanced signal on the thing you're interested in. And so that's really neat. And that's been used to uh, basically enhance the signal of pyruvate. So do the job of DNP, but for pennies on the dollar, so to speak. Where um, parahydrogen really took off in the last 10 years was due to this technique called SABER. It's signal amplification by reversible exchange. And it was really pioneered by Simon Duckett at the University of York. And it's, it's, it's a parahydrogen induced polarization, but it doesn't require on hydrogenation. Um, basically the parahydrogen and whatever substrate you're interested in reversibly exchange on a metal center. It's usually some iridium complex. And then you can, once again, using a magnetic field sweep, match the energy levels and transfer your magnetization from the parahydrogen onto your substrate. And then they can release and go off. And then your iridium complex accepts new fresh stuff. And so you basically do it over and over and over again and build up this enhanced signal of your substrate. And why this is really popular is you don't, you don't need to hydrogenate anything. And so you can do this for a lot of different chemicals. And also um, the hydrogenation, it changes your chemical a little bit. It adds two hydrogens onto it. You have a different molecule than you started with. With Sabre, it's not. You have the exact same thing you started with. You didn't have to hydrogenate it. And so I myself, I don't have a background in parahydrogen. I never did it until I started it as a faculty member a couple of years ago. Um, and so my group so far has kind of played around on entry level things with trying to um, characterize different ways of improving how we make parahydrogen or characterizing how long it lasts. Well, I'll talk about that now. Uh, so basically this, the amount of parahydrogen you have is based on the temperature and that's because um, Parahydrogen is the lower energy state. And so you can basically figure out how much parahydrogen you should have based on the temperature, uh, just using Boltzmann statistics. Uh, when you're making parahydrogen, 
typically there's two different temperature regimes. There's liquid nitrogen, which gives you about 50% para-hydrogen, and um, 20 Kelvin-ish, uh, which is right where hydrogen starts to liquefy, and that gets you near 100% para-hydrogen. And making this really, really simple, you, you float through some sort of a coil uh, just to get it really, really cold, and that coil can be submerged in liquid nitrogen, or it can be in some sort of a cryostat where it's at 20 Kelvin or so. Inside of the coil is a catalyst, it's usually iron hydroxide, and that's basically just used to scramble the spins. That way, when they wake up, they see it's really, really cold, and they go in the para state. Um, without the catalyst, you can still make para hydrogen. It just takes way, way, way longer. And so it's pretty easy to do. And liquid nitrogen cooled ones are really popular because um, it's cheap and it's easy to do. Liquid nitrogen is plentiful and easy to get, um, but it only gives you that 50%. So what if you have an application that could benefit from a little bit more? And so here's my very, very modest para hydrogen setup. We have our hydrogen gas cylinder with safety goggles, uh, a 10 liter liquid uh, nitrogen doer with our conversion coil. This is basically 10 feet of copper tubing, which we've coiled up to fit as much of it into the liquid nitrogen as possible. And inside of here is maybe one or two grams of iron hydroxide powder with some cotton balls shoved in so the powder doesn't blow out. We have a flow controller where we can change the flow from, where well, we have two flow controllers, so we can change the flow from like five, three or four milliliters per minute up to like 10 liters per minute if we want to. Um, and so it's a really, really basic setup. And liquid nitrogen, as you know, it boils at 77 Kelvin, but it actually stays a liquid for colder. You, you know, the triple point's at 63. And so if you could somehow lower the temperature of the liquid, then you could get better para hydrogen percentage. And so we went about trying this by basically pulling a vacuum on the airspace above the liquid nitrogen, which if you've done DNP, a lot of times you lower the temperature of the liquid helium by pulling a vacuum on it. So uh, we kind of took inspiration from that. Uh, and so if you lower it from 77 Kelvin down to 63, you should get a somewhat useful boost in para hydrogen percentage from about 50% to over 60. So non-trivial. And our goal is basically, can we use this to increase and make a better para hydrogen generator that's still cheap and easy to use and you can make it on your own. And we did. Um, basically, we just took a rubber stopper from like an Erlenmeyer flask and drilled four, four holes in it. Um, and two of the holes let the conversion coil pass through it. Uh, one is used to access the vacuum and one is used to basically dangle a thermocouple down inside of the liquid nitrogen. So we can take the temperature of the liquid as we're pulling a vacuum on it. We have a second temperature sensor that is actually fed into the parahydrogen coil itself. So we're monitoring the temperature of the gas as it's coming through the generator also. Um, and so all of this is basically hooked up to a scroll pump and we turned it on and we monitored the vacuum and we monitored the temperature over time. And we could see that we could pull a vacuum down to about 15 torr on that space above the liquid nitrogen. And that took about 15 minutes and it pretty well steadily stayed it out. You could probably do better um, if you had a better vacuum pump or a more airtight system. This is just kind of what we ran with. And when we did that, we could basically lower the temperature of the liquid nitrogen down to right around the triple point uh, over the course of about an hour or so. So we did this and then we compared that to basically our control, which is not rolling in a vacuum, just regular boiling liquid nitrogen the whole way. Um, and then we can collect our samples, basically collect the gas in a valved NMR tube, do NMR on it, you get a very weak signal because half of your sample doesn't give a signal because it's para. Um, and then give it a couple of days to relax the thermal equilibrium, do another NMR, integrate both peaks, take the ratio, a little bit of math, and basically calculate how much para hydrogen you get. Um, and so we did that and basically found that we could get upwards of 65% para hydrogen at a variety of different flow rates. So the flow rate is how quickly we're flowing the hydrogen gas through the system. So everywhere from 20 milliliters per minute to one liter per minute. And we can see um, basically at regular liquid nitrogen temperatures, we did exactly what we would expect, about 50%. When we pulled a vacuum on it, we increased that up to about 65%. It lowers a little bit with flow rate just because the gas isn't getting as cold because it's flowing through the coil faster. It doesn't have as much time to get cold. And so basically that very clearly shows that pulling the vacuum is better than not pulling the vacuum. You get a lower temperatures, you get a higher para hydrogen percentage. And also because we can calculate 
what our parisian percentage should be um, we can compare it with theory so our experimental control matches very well with our theoretical control our experimental with our vacuum cooling is actually a little bit better than what we expected i'm guessing we are underestimating the cooling power um, by the calibration of the thermocouple. Calibrating the thermocouple at 77 Kelvin is really easy. You just put in liquid nitrogen and you calibrate it. Um, at a lower temperature, you have the sliding scale of calibration. So we probably need to double check that. I'm guessing the temperature was probably lower than what we thought it was. And so we did that work kind of last spring and over the summer. Um, Rowan is still a largely undergrad institution, and my group is just full of undergrads. And so I had undergrads working on that, and my undergrads right now are working on another approach to lowering the temperature of liquid nitrogen. Uh, this case is basically injecting helium gas into the liquid, um, and those helium bubbles basically induce evaporative internal cooling of the liquid nitrogen itself. So instead of boiling out, um, the liquid nitrogen basically evaporates into the bubble and then the bubble carries it away. Um, and so basically you can also use this to lower the temperature of liquid nitrogen. Uh, we took inspiration from a paper we found uh, from about 10 years ago where they bubbled in um, helium gas into the liquid nitrogen and found that they could get pretty close to the triple point um, just by doing that. That wasn't in context of power hydrogen. That was just in context of making colder liquid nitrogen that wasn't bubbling or wasn't boiling all the time because you can basically inject a bunch of helium in turn off the bubbles and then it sits perfectly still until it warms back up to 77k and then it starts to boil again and that's kind of useful for some optical um experiments that beyond the scope of what we're talking about uh so basically really really preliminary stuff in the last few weeks uh has basically we've been bubbling in uh, helium gas in different flow rates and we see the temperature drop Unfortunately, we don't see it drop as much as that paper did and not as much as the vacuum did either. So instead of getting down to the triple point, we're only getting down around 70 to 72 Kelvin, which is a mild increase in parahydrogen percentage, but not as much as what we were hoping for. Uh, in the coming weeks, we're going to basically introduce a sparger, which basically instead of giving out blah, 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 big bubbles, it gives out tiny, small bubbles. And we're going to see if that helps with our bubble mediated cooling. And um, kind of wrapping up, the other part of parahydrogen we've been working on is basically measuring how long it stays parahydrogen. Um, once you make parahydrogen, it slowly starts converting back to its normal 25-75 ratio with orthohydrogen. Uh, and it happens really slowly because it's a forbidden transition. Uh, and so if you store it in an aluminum cylinder, it'll last for weeks. Um, but if you store it in a glass NMR tube, it only lasts for a few hours. And that's because glass is quite dirty. It has tons of paramagnetic, paramagnetic impurities all throughout the glass structure. And so uh, what we thought is, can we coat the inside surface with different surfactants um, in order to kind of form a barrier from the parahydrogen contacting those paramagnetic centers? And so we had a variety of different um, surfactants short, medium, long, and branched to basically see how does that affect um, the reconversion time of para or parahydrogen back into ortho. So here's a list of surfactants. It's just a range of different uh, silanes and siloxane molecules of different sizes. And on the uh, on the danger of being called a heretic, we didn't do NMR for this. We did Raman spectroscopy um, because you know the two spin isomers of hydrogen gas have different energy levels. Um, you can uh, you can basically get different Raman peaks and you can monitor the ratio between the peaks. And so whenever you have freshly made parahydrogen at liquid nitrogen temperatures, those two peaks are even because it's 50-50. When it relaxes to thermal equilibrium, your ortho is about three times the size of the para. So we monitored this using Raman directly on our NMR tube. So we can do NMR on it and we can also do Raman on it. Um, and basically you can take the ratio between the ortho peak and the parapeak and plot it as a function of time, fit it to an exponential and back out a time constant for that. And that's what we did. We did that for a variety of different um, surfactants and they all basically did better than the control, which we can all see here. We basically plotted out the different surfactants um, with this reconversion time constant and found that you know the better surfactants basically doubled the amount of time that, that the um, parahydrogen stayed parahydrogen. 
they all had kind of differing effects, um, but some of them did quite well. So uh, it's basically the medium length ones, whereas it's basically you know, silicon and about 10 carbon links um, for that surfactant. So uh, it's a useful effect and it's, it's, it's um, you know, potentially interesting. Um, so I think I'm running low on time, so I'm gonna end it here. I'd like to acknowledge uh, some of the DNP work that I showed early was done at MD Anderson and my co collaborator at Hunt Young University, as well as uh, everybody here at Rowan. These are all my students that contributed to this talk. I have more students than this, uh, but these are the ones that did parahydrogen work, as well as Rob, uh, who helped out with the Raman work as well. And so uh, thank you all for your attention. I'll, I'll stop here, and if there's any questions, I'm happy to answer. So I think Brad might be muted again, but I'll jump in. Um, okay. <laughs> uh, yeah, so um, I guess on, on the topic of the parahydrogen, so you, you're you're kind of going two different approaches with the vacuum uh, vacuum sealing of the, the liquid nitrogen as well as the helium bubbling. Is there uh, an additive effect if you combine both of these together? I don't know. I hadn't considered that. Um... Yeah, I honestly don't know. Um, I mean, maybe. <laughs> I think the thing is, is with the vacuum, we're already hitting the triple point, mm -hmm. and not much below that, you start to freeze it. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, making it colder is even better. I think you can probably get the liquid, the, the nitrogen down to maybe 55 Kelvin in that range. The problem is, is you'll go from a liquid to a slush to a solid. And I think the slush is fine. I think the solid is probably bad because it won't be as, as good thermal contact with the coil because the coil will probably melt the ice right around it and then have a gap there. And then it won't be as cold where the copper coil is. Um, so you might be able to get some benefits, um, but honestly, the, the easier thing might just be having a better vacuum pump set up and, sure. and being able to put, because the helium's neat and I like having the students do it, but at the end of the day, it's a lot of helium gas that I'm just bubbling into nitrogen and then is escaping to the air and then it's gone right. forever. Um, so it's, it's a neat demonstration. I don't know if I'm going to do it long term, though. Uh, OK, so it looks like we have a question in the chat here. Um, Jacob Zingaro asks, can parahydrogen be used in protein NMR? Hi, Jake. Uh, good question. Um, not yet but perhaps in the future. So one thing that they've done recently, by they, I mean other people in the field, um, they've been able to demonstrate enhancing the signal of amino acids um, using parahydrogen. And so that's a building block of proteins. And so I would say uh, not yet, but maybe in the next five years or so, you could start to see some of that. And it'll be initially be in very small general test proteins before it gets into anything really super cool or, or, or useful. But I, I think it might be coming on the horizon. All right, I think I figured out my audio. Um, <laughs> yay. So I had a question with the uh, the sidearm hydrogenation for transferring that magnization. Is there a like general rule of thumb for you need X double bonds to break in order to cover like a molecule of X size if we're thinking like, I'm thinking from like, if you want to do like metabolomics type, uh, trace the breakdown of a particular um, drug product or whatever that's fairly large, would you need to have multiple sidearms to hydrogenate or is just like a small sidearm hydrogenate that with parahydrogen, would you get sufficient enhancement to well, go that way? Yeah, sure. Um, sorry for button in. Um, where I've only seen it is in a few small cases, a lot of them using pyruvate, which is already a pretty small molecule. Um, and so it's typically just on one end of the pyruvate, and then uh, it just basically enhances the carbon, which they've already isotopically enriched at that spot. So the last kind of the last carbon on the pyruvate. Um, so it'll enhance that one, and then it gets cleave, chemically cleaved and broken off. Um, if you wanted a larger 
molecule with multiple sites. I haven't seen that before, um, but it's all fairly newish stuff. Probably in the last three or four years, um, so you know, still still actively working on it for those groups. Cool. Thanks. Uh, we got time for one or two more questions. If anyone has one um, online, just go ahead and raise your hand or, or unmute and ask. All right, yeah, go ahead, Ivan. Hi, Nick. Uh, great talk. Um, <clears throat> I've seen uh, a lot of interest lately in hyperpolarized water, and I'm wondering if you can see any way of uh, teaming up parahydrogen to make hyperpolarized water. Yes, people have done that. Um, I think Russ Bauer's group down in Florida has been working on that recently, and my um, postdoc advisor, uh, Pratip Bhattacharya at, at MD Anderson, before he moved to MD Anderson, um, he did a little bit of that as well. So yes, you can use parahydrogen to polarize water. I think one of the problems is just the T1. It's, I think it's just, it's gone. Um, and so that's something that you have to fight against. But yeah, that's doable. And uh, last question to uh, Bernie. Hey, Nick, that was a really great talk. Um, thank you for that. I was just wondering if you would um, be able to um, go back and cover that magnet again. I believe it was the Tesla Tron. That was, that was some interesting looking magnet. I don't think I've seen something like that before. And I believe you said that the sample was was also put in a, was it in a vacuum? Yeah, let me see here. Where is my, uh, that's it. Yeah, sorry, I've got, uh, where to go? All right, can we see it? Um, so basically, my understanding, this is kind of, if, if you go by a hypersense, which is your, your preclinical, uh, push button DNP kit. Um, this is what's inside of it um, with a bunch of other stuff. And so it's a really short magnet because there's no probe underneath. Everything feeds in from the top. Um, and so it's just a, it looks a lot like a really short NMR magnet. Up here, it's hard to see. There's a little needle valve handle, which goes way down to the bottom. And inside is a little capillary that basically feeds from the liquid helium reservoir of the magnet into the cryostat itself. There's a built-in cryostat uh, where the uh -huh. you know the top of the bore opens up. Uh, and you can open up this needle valve and flush liquid helium into your sample chamber. And then uh, basically right here where the mouse is, is a vacuum port. And so I don't have it hooked up right now, but you hook up a vacuum pump to it. And just like lowering the temperature of the liquid nitrogen using a vacuum pump, uh, you do the okay. same thing for helium. Yeah. And so mm -hmm. you can basically get from 4K down to, this should get, down to like one and a half K uh, for short periods of time at least. And then right. all of this up here is basically a 7.8 gigahertz microwave source or millimeter wave source that goes into a frequency multiplier and amplifier um, that basically multiplies it out to 140 gigahertz and then it feeds in a waveguide down into the cryostat. And then there's also um, a coax I cable see. for a built-in. So basically, you take off a few clamps and this whole thing from up here down to here pulls out of the magnet and it's probably about three and a half feet long. Um, and oh, that's wow. basically where the probe and where the microwave source and temperature sensors and, and all of that stuff, it all feeds in through the top. Got it. Does that help? Are you, any other questions? Yeah, yeah, perfect. Thank you, Nick. All Thanks right. Very much. Well, thank you for the questions. And thank you all for your attention. I, I, this is my first time at this uh, at this meeting, and uh, I'm very happy that you all uh, had me talk. Yeah, thanks, Nick.